Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? And welcome to the 14th session out of 20. So there's going to be six left of the intellectual seerah. And we are continuing from where we left off with Uhud with some very important lessons. In fact, some of the most important lessons in the entire seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And where we left off was we were talking about the battle itself, the thick of the thickness of the battle, or the thick of it. And in particular, we stopped at a place where we were talking about some of the fighting that had uh, taken place. Uh, let's actually do a quick recap. Uh, what are some of the things we said in the beginning of how the battle started? Who left? There were 300 people who left. Who, who left? Who defected? Um, what was going on? What do, Uthman, what do you have to say about this? Um, so it was Abdullah ibn Ubay. Mm. Um, he was uh, one of the guys who obviously retreated from the Prophet's side and we discussed how even from a psychological perspective this could have affected the Muslims uh, psychologically imagine you're going to battle and a third or a quarter of the army I think it was a third um, let, retreated and went back to uh, Medina so if you're standing there trying to face the enemy you're uh, psychologically potentially in a, a weak and more vulnerable situation. So that was one of the things we cited. Yes, excellent uh, summary there. I was going to ask uh, another question, which is, in the beginning of the battle, who would you say had the upper hand? Um, the Meccans. The Meccans? Um, essentially, they had the Muslims? Or the, uh, oh, the not, not, the not Muslims, yeah. Who, in the beginning of the battle? In the beginning of the battle. Um, oh, in the beginning of the battle. Oh, it, during the battle, there was a Muslim. Sorry, um, they had the upper hand. They were fighting and they were and they were winning. Um, but from on paper, it seemed like obviously the advantage was on their side. The so what, what what was the key mistake that took place? There? It was the archers on the hill who obviously moved from their position and uh, left an opening for uh, Khalid bin Walid, who uh, ended up being one of the greatest uh, companions of, of the Prophet. Once he converted, so yeah, he he was able to um, attack, and that's when the advantage was on the non-Muslim side. Tell us a little bit more about that, Shamir. Uh, when that happened, what what would you say? How would you categorize that? Yeah, so um, the archers, um, the reason for them there is um, because the Muslims were still out outnumbered. Um, if need be, then the archers would be able to strike them um, without getting damaged. And what happened is. Um, the Muslims were winning the battle and they saw the booty which was left which is um, things like armor and gold and silver things like that and then um, and then they saw that and they thought that they they would they would be missing out in that uh, in that in that booty but then but then the Prophet told them before do not move from the position um, even if the enemy has been defeated or or something along those lines um, but then they moved anyway and then um, then Khalid bin Walid was able to um, get around the back of them and then attack the Muslims from the back. Mm. That's, and that's how they got and, to meet And they were in full retreat, in fact, the Mushrikites at that time. But as they were in full retreat, Khalid bin Walid spotted this weakness and exploited this weakness, which shows you that, you know, it's, it just takes one mistake, especially with people at that caliber, mm. on that level. Just takes one. And this is the same in sports. You know, you can have a very strong team Okay, we see at the highest level of Premiership football and stuff like that, they're attacking, and then all it takes is one defender to one defender to make a mistake. Forget about the rest of the defenders, one defender to make a mistake, and the entire team has been penetrated, and the goal is scored. It's a counterattack strategy. Napoleon Napoleon once said, um, "I'm the man who lost the battle at five o'clock and won it back at seven. Mm. So you know the ebb and flow of battle. It's it's very it's always in flux." Mm -hmm. Which is which shows you the importance. I mean, the, the key characteristics of Khalid Walid, which we will probably talk about one day in more detail when we do like some Sahabis, you know, Sirahs and stuff like that, is that he was quick-witted. And by the way, if you want to see a a characteristic in most of sports sportsmen's uh, you know psyche or Arsenal capabilities, 
which make them at the highest level is that quick quittedness, its ability to act without hesitation. It's the, about, it's the ability to make a move without flinching, without, without thinking too much. It's just real, he knew when to act. He, you know when an opportunity, what an opportunity looks like, and you know how to exploit that opportunity. People at the highest level do that. It's not just sports people, chess, chess masters, especially speed chess. As soon as they see it, they move. So it shows you that if your IQ is too slow, in certain contexts, your IQ is uh, irrelevant or it's not, it's ineffectual. Like if you're, if you're a clever person, but you're slow and clever, it's not the same as being clever and fast, if that makes sense. And Khalid ibn Walid was both clever and, and fast. Some ayahs came in the Quran uh, exposing some of the uh, belief systems of the munafiqun, uh, which we can read here actually, because I got the, the, the ayahs out. Allah says, Allahumma yaktumun. So for example, in this particular ayah, Allah is saying that one of the reasons this whole thing took place was that Allah can test the hypocrites. And it was said to them, Come and fight in the way of Allah. Or at least defend yourselves. And they said, had we known fighting will take place, we would certainly have followed you. Uh, they were at that day closer to disbelief than faith. Saying with their mouths that which was not in their hearts, and Allah has full knowledge of what they conceal. And it continues. I mean, this, this whole section, so Al-Amran, by the way, there's a whole section, which you can read maybe from Lishas for the sake of argument, say verse 150 onwards. And we'll go through some of them, and some of Ibn, uh, Ibn Kathir's tafsir of this. A whole section talking about the psychology of the munafiqun and the wisdoms of what this, why Allah had made this happen, why He allowed this to happen. For example, here it says very interesting. الَّذِينَ قَالُوا لِإِخْوَانِهِمْ وَقَعَدُوا لَوْ أَطَاعُونَا مَا قُتِلُوا You know, if the, the ones who said to their brethren, if they had really followed us, they wouldn't have been killed. قُلْ فَدَرَأُوا عَنْ أَنفُسِكُمُ الْمَوْتَ إِن كُنْتُمْ Sadiqin, that go ahead and avert death from yourselves. And we spoke at some detail about the fact that death can get come to you from anywhere you want. We saw COVID. COVID was killing people. You know, you can have some kind of uh, disease. You can have cancer. You can have anything. So, effectively, Allah is saying that you're not in control of this process of life and death that you think you're so in control of. And then you have famous verses here, you know, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتِ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عَنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ فَرِحِينَ بِمَا أَتَهَمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ And so on. That, you know, do not think that the ones who have been killed in the sake of Allah, that they are dead, that, that they are alive with Allah, that Allah is providing for them and so on. Uh, let me see if there's anything else in, in this sequence. We will come to some of the verses here actually, because I've, I've put it on the slides. But the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, just going back to the battle itself, what he done was that he mobilized his army and he arranged them into two rows to prepare them for a fight. So he selected 50 skillful archers and he basically scored, formed a squad and made them under the command of Abdullah ibn Jubair ibn uh, Nu'man al-Ansari. He issued his orders to them to stay where they were. We just mentioned this, right? On the mountain top and so on. And later on, they went against that, against that particular thing. Um, now, there are some standout figures that were very impressive and heroic on the day of Ahud, of Ahud and one of them was Abu Dujana. And he was uh, known, and he's usually used as an example of somebody, you know, he, the, his demeanor was uh, of an arrogant demeanor. And the Prophet ﷺ said that this kind of demeanor, this kind of mishia, this kind of the way he was walking around, is not be it's not beloved to Allah. It's in fact hated to Allah, except in this context. You know. But let's stick with this for a second, because someone will say, okay, well then, you know, we can use this demeanor. And say so it's very difficult to decide what context that is. So, for example, we had this conversation before I went on <laughs> with David Wood, uh, and I, because of who he was. 
I had a conversation. I said, look, the way I want to to go ahead with him is I want to be quite arrogant with him, if you like. There, there needs to be a flair. There needs to be kind of like a brazen. A lot of the mashayikh at the time when I was making that judgment said, yes, you can. because And they used Abu Dujan. It's Qiyas and Ali Abu Dujan. Because Abu Dujan is like, for example, the same thing. It's a kind of, you know, you go against the enemy. And if you have confidence, confidence is very contagious. Confidence is extremely contagious. Someone can say something false in confidence, but because of their confidence, they can make it look true. So especially if you're going against, I mean, Islam is a confident religion. I remember reading Ayan Hirsi Ali's book, you know, when I was attacking, going for her, because that's another person I had to have the same Abu Dujana kind of behavior with. And, um, and she said something interesting. I mean, uh, she doesn't usually say something. She's making a thousand mistakes in her books, and I was laughing half the time and rolling my eyes the other half. But she said something which I found interesting, which is that she said, Allah is a fiery God. This is a sentence in her book. I'll, I'll, I can remember it. And I thought, what an interesting way of putting it. Uh, what a fiery God, meaning that the, the confidence she realizes, she recognizes that the confidence that comes from the Quran is in fact... It's a permeating confidence. It's a fiery confidence. If you think, if you had to, what is the style of the Quran? Is it, is it a, especially when it's speaking about issues to do with salvation, and it's, it's a very conf, it's an extremely, it's the most confident religious book on the earth. In the same surah, Surah Al Amran, you have this thing which people would look at and raise their eyebrow, but really they'll be a bit scared about it as well if they're coming from different traditions, which is that. Uh, you know, you know, let us call our sons and 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 uh, children and so on whenever uh, tahil, and we do this mubahala فنجعل لعنة الله على الكاذبين and we will do لعنة الله على الكاذبين the one who's the لعنة of Allah the, the 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 curse of God will be on the one who's li on the liar. Now that's a very, very confident thing for a religious person to to do. Because if you believe in God, but think about it, you'd have to be an atheist. If you truly believe in God, and you believe in the curse of God, if you believe in those two things, and and you're lying about your religion, to go out to the Christians and to the Jews and say, look, I'm so sure about my religion, I'm willing to ruin my entire life by invoking the curse of God on me. That's an extremely confident thing to do. So Abu Dujana, in this context, he manifested that confidence. And in fact, it wouldn't be arrogance in this situation. It would be arrogance in other situations. In this situation, it is confidence. Which shows you something interesting. That what is seen to be arrogant in some contexts is actually confidence in others. It's not arrogance in, in, in some contexts. So it, there is acceptable and unacceptable ones. Well, how you behave in some contexts is, is unacceptable in other contexts. So for example, Allah says that you should be adillatan ala al-mu'mineen, that you should be very humble with believers. Waqfid janahaka liman ittaba'aka min al-mu'mineen. Allah says in the Quran, for example, that you should lower your wing to those who follow you from the believers. And so there are many verses like that. And if you manifest arrogance in this context, then it's not, it's not correct. But Abu Dujana here, because of what this was, very dangerous fight. And a fight, by the way, where the Prophet ﷺ himself, as we see, was succumbed to injury. Which is extremely powerful. Because if you consider that the Prophet ﷺ succumbed to injury himself, the, the, the arrow, some, some way I say the arrow came into his mouth and broke his tooth. And then they had to remove it. And he was fighting himself. And what I find so powerful, so powerful, وَالرَّسُولُ يَدْعَوْكُمْ فِي أُخْرَاكُمْ There's somewhere here. وَالرَّسُولُ يَدْعَوْكُمْ فِي أُخْرَاكُمْ فَأَصَابَكُمْ غَمَّا بِغَمْ And the Prophet, he is calling you from behind. Because at this time, when this archers left, people went into fight or flight. It's true. Some of them ran away. Some of them retreated. They went for the, they went for the mountain. It's true. Some of the companions, they, they fled. I will explain the psychology of that in a second. But some of them, they fled. Because now, you've got Khalid and Walid, you've got all of these people, they're coming back. And there was only a few people now that were there. Now, this incident, if you think about it, honestly, 
is a proof for the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi And I'll explain why. If you consider how he behaved, now it's already unusual. We have to accept. It's already unusual, especially in light of contemporary events, for a leader of an army to engage in the fighting himself. It's already unusual. Not just engage in the fighting, but engage in the fighting to the extent where he will be injured. And he is the only time where the Prophet ﷺ killed somebody. Uh, we'll come to it. It's Abu Ubay ibn Khalaf. And it will see, we'll see it in this particular battle. So he was inflicting harm and harm was being inflicted upon him. But the ayah is saying, fi The Prophet is calling you from behind you. So in other words, you've ran so far. If tusaiduna, wala tulwuna ala ahadin, you are running. Tusaidun, you're going up the hill. You're literally running up the hill. You aren't even looking back. Wala tulwuna ala ahadin, wa rasulu yadaukum fi ukhrakum. So when you, well, you're running up the hill, and you aren't even looking, because you know when you're in, in panic and shock. You run, you don't even want to look behind. They're all running. Allah is now he's exposing, he's reprimanding. He is. He's reprimanding these particular companions. That you fled and you ran up that mountain. And the Prophet was calling you from behind you. Which means what? The Prophet was still there. Now, if you consider the fact, we've already said it's unusual for somebody to fight. In a situation like that. But there's another e element here, which is this. How is it that a man like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa who has not been known to be a military, to have military experience, like we've just read his Meccan seerah, he wasn't known to be this like military fighter fighting the tribes. He wasn't known for that. He didn't have great experience on the field. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't exposed to that. How could it be that a man who wasn't exposed to that repeated level of military engagement could have such courage that he would be one of the only people, not only on the field, but calling the others to come back on the field? Where do you get that from? Because, we're going to come to this, if you look at the science of fight or flight, the fight or flight science, we're going to come to this. There is something in the body called the fight or flight response. Now we've already spoken about the autonomic nervous system. And we'll come to it in a, in a second. But the fight or flight response is almost, it's as close to involuntary that you're going to get. It's as close to that as you're going to get. It's an instinctive reaction. The fact that he re reacted in a way which was measured, where you would expect from him, a flight response without having military experience is psychological testimony of his veracity as a true prophet. Because it doesn't matter what you're claiming or what kind of gain you're trying to... You are now isolated. You have a high and real chance of being killed. And yet, not only are you on the field with Talha and Sa'ad, they were famously there with him, helping him, there were two people. You are on the field, but you are calling the others to be on the field as well. This is uh, too much of an expectation of a novice military fighter. Because someone who's only had one military expedition, it would be called a novice. A novice military general. That's what he would be called. So how could he be acting like this as a novice? This is, uh, and I'm gonna. It's interesting because I was re reading Ross Rogers. I'm gonna read some of the stuff he says. He's, he has some interesting analysis on this, actually, as a general in America, Orientalist and non-Muslim account. And he 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 actually summarized some of the differences between how Abu Sufyan was thinking, how Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was thinking, and why, in a way, he was indicating why Muhammad Sallallahu was more effective. Yeah. But it shows you there's a lots of points here. Leadership. This is one of the greatest evidences of 
pinnacle leadership by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu You cannot not respect the Prophet after that. Now, now his followers are going to see that he done that. He was the bravest among them. Forever they have to, they have to respect him. And I was speaking to Adnan Rashid before about Tipu Sultan. And he was saying the same thing about Tipu Sultan. Tipu Sultan, if you don't know who he is, was effectively a Mysore Indian Muslim, you know, fighter. And he was what, the first real resistance fighter in India against the British colonial rule. Real first resistance, organized resistance. And he died on the field. And he would always fight himself. And he would pride himself on that. And, and his followers, and you'll see this with the followers of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. They were so attached to him by loyalty. To a level where everybody else could not expect. And because they saw how he attached he was to the cause, they were attached to him and the cause. So if you can't do what you're telling everyone else to do, then don't expect people to do it as well. And that's why, uh, interestingly, in the, in the Iraq war, George Galloway, when he was attacking the politicians at the time, one of his key lines was, why don't you put the tin hat on and get into the fight yourself? And this was it resonated quite heavily, actually, with the British public. Because why are you telling people to fight and you're at home? It's, it's, it's a disgusting and despicable cow. It's actually cowardly, in my opinion. That is the, if, you, if the opportunity is there for you to fight and you are not fighting, but you're telling other people to fight on your behalf, that is actually a cowardly stance. Like Ben Shapiro and others. <laughs> it's true. He can go and fight for the Israeli army. A lot of them can fight for the Israeli they're, they're citizens of Israel. But they don't do it and they're telling other people to do it. So, we've spoken about the Arch's mistakes. Okay, so this is some of the tafsir, and maybe you can read this in your own time, of what Ibn Kathir says, but it's not that big, so maybe we can read it, actually. But one interesting thing, you know, there is an ayah in, the, in Surah Al-Amran as well, which is, سَنُلْقِي فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُ الرَّعْبَ بِمَا أَشْرَكُوا بِاللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُنَزِّلْ بِهِ سُلْطَانًا وَمَأْوَاهُمْ النَّارُ وَبِئْسَ مَثْلَ الظَّالِمِينَ That we will put terror in the hearts of people. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in a hadith, he says, أُعْتِيتُ خَمْسًا لَمْ يُعْتِيهُنَّ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ قَبْلِ And the first thing he says, he said, I've been given five, some things, how many? Five things, that the prophets before me were not given. And one of the things he said, نُصِرْتُ بِالرَّعْبِ I was, I was given victory by terror. Terror. People became f fearful of him. People were scared of the Prophet. If someone doesn't respect your consequences at all, if there's no level of someone respecting your consequences, especially enemies, then there's no way you're going to attain victory. Just remember that. that's a golden principle. Wherever you go, if you have no consequences, you have no power. If you have no consequences, you have no power. Especially with enemies. No one cares about it how merciful you are or compassion all these kinds of things if you have no consequences people mess you around and so the Prophet ﷺ, one of the things is people did fear him actually his enemies feared him and interestingly you know this this ayah here which says وَلَقَدْ صَدَقَكَمُ اللَّهُ وَعْدَهُ إِذْ تَحُسُّونَهُمْ بِإِذْنِ حَتَّى إِذَا فَشِلْتُمْ وَتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ وَعَصَيْتُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا أَرَاكُمْ مَا تُحِبُّونَ This حَتَّى إِذَا فَشِلْتُمْ here. In common Arabic, fashal means failure. But that's not what this word means in this verse. Because what this verse means, fashiltum means lost courage. According to Ibn Kathir's uh, tafsir, as you can see. Ibn Juraj said that Ibn Abbas said, Fashiltum means lost courage. Which, which brings us to a question, how do you lose courage? And by the way, losing courage is not the same as becoming a coward. Because courage or shaja'ah is sifatun za'ida. It's an additional, it's an additional attribute. Whereas uh, jubun or having, being a coward 
is a narkis sifa. It's something you're, you're, it's a deprecation of some sorts. Losing courage means you are at a certain level and some of you... So ha the question is, how do you uh, lose it? And we're going to move on to this. Very interesting. If we go to... The fleeing we've already spoken to. Now, we go to... <laughs> slide 24. Because... We've already spoken about this, but I think it's important to speak about this in a little bit of scientific detail. Because a lot of the humiliations of human being come from this. And it's, it's impossible, or it's, imp yeah, it's, it's important for us to know, right, theoretically how this works. So it doesn't affect us practically. We live in London. I mean, many people watching this live all over the world, and there's different things that they're going to face of this kind of... Uh, of this kind of nature. So let's take a look at how can you lose courage. So let's look at the scientific uh, data on this. This is from Harvard Health. Okay. First of all, let's get someone to read this. Uh, all right. So slide 24, you're going to read this, brother? Sounding the alarm. Yeah. Yeah. The stress response begins in the brain. See illustration. When someone confronts an oncoming car or other danger, the eyes or ears, or both, send the information into the amygdala, an area of the brain that contributes to the emotional processing. The amygdala interprets the images and sounds. When it perceives danger, it instantly sends a distress signal to the hypothalamus. When someone experiences a stressful event, the amygdala, an area of the brain that contributes to emotional processing, sends a distress signal to the hypothalamus. This area of the brain functions like a command center, communicating with the rest of the body through the nervous system so that the person has the energy to fight or flee. Keep going. The, hypotha yeah. the hypothalamus is a bit like a command center. This area of the brain communicates with the rest of the body through the autonomic nervous system, which controls such involuntary body functions such as breathing, blood pressure, heartbeat, and the dilation or constriction of key blood vessels and small airways in the lungs called bronchioles. The autonomic nervous system has two components, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system functions like a gas, like a gas pedal in a car. It triggers a fight or flight response, providing the body with a burst of energy so that it can respond to perceived dangers. The parasympathetic nervous system acts like a brake. It promotes the rest and digest response that calms the body down after the danger has passed. Okay, after, after the amygdala sends a distress signal, the hypothalamus activates the sympathetic nervous system by sending signals through the autonomic nerves to the adre adrenal glands. These glands respond by pumping the hormone epinef epinephrine, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, into the bloodstream. As epinephrine circulates through the body, it brings on a number of physiological changes. The heart beats faster than normal, pushing blood to the muscles, heart and other vital organs. Pulse rate and blood pressure goes up. The person undergoing these changes also starts to breathe more rapidly. Small airways in the lungs open wide. This way, the lungs can take in as much oxygen as possible with each breath. Extra oxygen is sent to the brain, increasing alertness. Sight, hearing and other senses become sharper. Meanwhile, epinephrine, epinephrine triggers the release of blood sugar, glucose and fats from temporary storage sites in the body. These nutrients flood into the bloodstream, supplying energy to all parts of the body. Okay, so there's a few things now in terms of... To, to just break this down, right? Let me break this down. I'll tell you why I'm mentioning this. So the fleeing of the Sahab, the companions, that's what we're talking about. This would be more fit into what you would call uh, the flight response, not the fight response. And even for courageous people, anyone can be susceptible to the, the flight response. And, and the point for us as a lesson is um, actually we need to be able to moderate this flight response because it can happen to anyone. If it can happen to the companions, it can happen to absolutely anybody. So how um, to do so? First, you need to understand the mechanisms of that scientifically. I think it's, we're living in an age where that's an advantage for us. We can understand the mechanisms of it. So what we've just read is the following. Is that it's saying we as a human being have something called the autonomic nervous system, the ANC. And the ANC is divided into two separate things. One called the sympathetic nervous system and one called the parasympathetic nervous system. 
Now, the way to remember this is that the sympathetic, the parasympathetic nervous system is for red, rest and digest. Resting and digesting. So if you want to eat food and that kind of thing, when your stomach is digesting food, or when you're sleeping, your parasympathetic nervous system, that is what is activated at that particular time. When you are in a state of shock, for example, if I see a, if a, a snake comes on, I don't care who you are. And in fact, if this doesn't happen, you, there's something wrong with you. You know, if there's a snake that comes on, you know it's a venomous snake, and it comes trying to kill you, and there's no reaction whatsoever, you're just like that. Then there's, then there's something, uh, something wrong here, or maybe there's something right, and I'll tell you, I'll explain what I mean by something right. But if there's a snake, unless you've had experience with snakes, and you know how to control the snake, you won't know how to deal with the snake. What happens when the sympathetic nervous system is active is, as it was mentioned, your pupils start to dilate. Number one thing, your eyes, the pupils, start to get bigger. If, you, if there was a magnifying glass on it, you'll see that. Number two, what will happen is that your, your, arms start, your hands start to get sweaty. So you start, your respiratory system comes out back. Your heart rate goes up. Immediately, your heart rate goes up because of the perceived threat. So you start acting instinctively. And what it was saying is that in the brain, there are two or three different parts, which I mentioned in the literature. One of them is the amygdala. Now, the amygdala itself is the place where instinct happens, where, where it's responsible for the instinctive reactions of human being. Then you have two other places, which many different um, kind of scientists and others would mention. One of them is the prefrontal cortex, and the other one is the hippocampus. The hippocampus is responsible for many different things. Of them is spatial navigation and these kind of things. And by the way, interestingly about the hippocampus, the hippocampus has a kind of neuroplasticity, so it can actually grow. And there's been studies that have been shown that even if you learn certain things about directions and stuff like that, like the Maguire study, 2000, that your hippocampus can actually grow. The gray matter in it can grow. Now, what is interesting is that I was looking into this and people with PTSD and anxiety disorders, generalized anxiety disorders and depression, people with these kinds of disorders, they are, in fact, they have a, oh, they, a hyperactive amygdala and the hypoactive, you see, uh, a hypoactive uh, hippocampus, a hypoactive prefrontal cortex. Hypoactive means it's smaller, it's not working as much as it should be. Hyperactive it means it's bigger, it's acting, it's overworking, you see. So when you've got PTSD, because you're, the, the, the remnants of that shock, that whatever shock you felt, you see, the remnants of that shock are still there, so your mind is still in overdrive. And so the question is, the question is, how do we put ourselves in a position where we don't panic as much? Because there's two or three different kinds of panic here, and they're quite interestingly connected. There's generalized panic. People are sometimes, nowadays, we're living in an age of anxiety. People are anxious for no reason. People, are, when I say for no reason, no extraneous variable is causing this particular thing. Yet, the people are still anxious. And so there's all kinds of, you see, emotional regulation techniques that people are talking about nowadays. Emotional regulation techniques, deep breathing, mindfulness, distraction techniques, um, different types of techniques. Sleep, getting sleep in order, for example, very important. Different things you might have heard of uh, in general. So there are different types of technique, but for me, looking at the different things, yes, distraction can be helpful sometimes, there's no doubt. Like, for example, if you've lost a parent, if you've lost somebody you love, if you have grief, distraction can be one of the most effective ways of getting on with your day, for example. Like we're fasting right now, distraction can be quite good in terms of we're distracting ourselves from the pain of fasting. <laughs> in a way, this is a distraction technique. But when, it's, when the sympathetic nervous system, yes, when that's, when that's overdriving, the, the only real way that I've seen that really works is exposure therapy. Hence, going back to the point I was making about the Prophet Muhammad, I find it shocking that he was able to act in that way, being a, on paper, novice military 
uh, general at that time because he only had one real expedition, which is Badr, real big one. He's all Sarai, lots of Sarai, but real one big one. The fact that he was calling them behind, that he was staying in his place, that he was engaging in, that is very surprising. Because the question is, why didn't his amygdala, amygdala go out of control? Why is his prefrontal cortex and his hippocampus so well developed that it's able to act in this way, calculate, effectively calculate the pros and cons of acting in a certain behavior? Did it? Is there any record of him having any kind of dispute or argument you know, or physical altercation pre, you know, pre-revelation? Dispute and argument? How I mean, do you to, explain? Has he, uh, you know, I mean, as, as, uh, has he ever had a disagreement, a physical disagreement with somebody? Oh, a physical one? Yeah, I mean, there's, is there any Sheikh, record? Is there anything of about that? Did he get into a fight before, Sheikh? Of yeah, before the, do we have anything about that in the Sira of Mecca? Mecca the period? only thing known, uh, Rukana, uh, when he but he didn't yani, engage in a fight. Yani. No, I mean, before, 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 before Wahi, prophethood, mm. yes, because we don't have that much about the Prophet before mm. prophethood, yeah. So that makes it more yeah. remarkable, yeah, yeah, see. yeah, yeah, it makes it more because he didn't have that <coughs> kind of experience. Do you mm. see, do you see what I'm saying here? I, I, from all the Sira's I've ever listened to, no one's ever mentioned this point, and I, I, I know why. The reason why, no, honestly, because, let, let me put it this way. You only know about this when you get engaged in this kind of thing. Now, Yanni, let me explain something. Let's say you bring a boxer, you know, a, a boxer, someone who does boxing, like Anthony Joshua, like, you know, Tyson Fury or someone like that. If you tell him to do a boxing fight tomorrow, he probably has zero nerves. If he's against a formidable opponent, he'll probably have some nerves because he could lose. But if it's against a, an amateur or something, he'll have no nerves because he's been there so many times, he's done it so many times before. It's like public speaking, right? Many of you guys now, mashallah, have been your public speakers in your own little right because, <laughs> oh, alhamdulillah, like, you know, you, you've started doing the public speaking, right? The first time you do it, you start thinking a hundred times. I remember doing public speaking a long time ago and I thought so many times, now, now it's like going into my bedroom and speaking to my wife. It's even less than that. It's even, it's nothing. It's because it's, you've done it so many times, you know what... You know what to expect. Do you know what I mean? The, predict the unpredictability factor reduces the amygdala, slows down the prefrontal cortex, basically takes control, if you want to put it in scientific terms. Yes? If you get a boxer, he'll be very confident. You put him in a kickboxing match, immediately he'll feel shocked. Because when he gets kicked in the leg, and this is something that is well known in the martial arts world, the moment he gets kicked in the leg or that teep goes into his stomach, or that is because it's a different kind of pain. He doesn't know what he's doing, what's happening here. He doesn't know what the hell's going on. And these experiments have already been done. So what I'm saying is that the moment you're confronted with a new kind of pain, a new kind of unpredictability, the moment your amygdala starts to flare up again. It's the same thing with, we mentioned Anthony Joshua. That I saw a video of him going up the mountain. Anthony Joshua, for those who don't know, he's like the previous heavyweight champion of the world in boxing. And he was going up this kind of mountain rock climbing, and he found it very scary. Now, if you haven't done rock climbing before, you'll find it very scary. Now you, you see what's a fad is that people going into cold plunge. They get a cold bath, and they go inside it. When I went to Norway, I decided, you know what, forget all these people. I took it off, I jumped in, they got cold. And it was minus 10 anyway. I said, I'm going to do this thing. And I came out, yes, I did feel a bit more renewed, but I think they're, to be honest, they're going too far with this thing. It's become like a religion for these guys. You know? it's, it's, I, I, and I, the, probably the reason why they're doing this cold plunge stuff is because they don't have the excitement in their life. So they have to just put themselves in the cold or do something uh, unusual, extraordinary, because there's no war anymore. So they have to do this. But, but the point I'm making is, it's not always transferable. You can be a great public speaker. If you bring the greatest public speaker in the world, put him in a boxing match, his anxiety is going to go all up the roof, off the roof, off the charts. His amygdala is going to go up because it's, it's a different kind of thing. He's not used to it. Now, if you bring someone who's great at cold plunge, bring him into a, this other context. <laughs> he's been able to control his amygdala in this context, but he's not been able to control it in that context. So for us, we need to find the contexts which are most closely related to 
physical confrontation. And I know this is becoming like, I've mentioned this to you a few times, but the reason why it's very, very important, the Prophet ﷺ said to us in hadith, he said that whoever dies and he doesn't have something in his heart to engage in jihad, then he dies with one of the uh, characteristics of the munafiqun. Can you believe that? Have you ever thought of this? There's hadith of the Prophet where he's saying that if you've never considered engaging in physical confrontation for the sake of Allah, that you have something of nifaq inside of you, you have something of hypocrisy inside of you. But then if you're not preparing for... As the Quran says, if they really wanted to, they would have done some preparation for it. How do you know that the world won't change in the next 30, 40 years that every single one of us in this room and every one of us watching this thing won't have to defend someone or something in a physical capacity? And if that is the case, if the, if the geopolitics of the world changes to that extent, which it could, because no one knows with geopolitics, <coughs> then why do you want to be put at a disadvantage where you never, where you'll get overwhelmed immediately? So what I'm saying is that there are contexts which you can, you, you should, and we should really invest in as an ummah. Especially if we want victory, there's no other path to victory. Let me just be clear about this. You, you want victory as an ummah. Yeah, if you want victory as an ummah, there's no other path to victory but the path of resistance. Now, I'm not saying we should do anything illegal. But what I'm saying is we need to get ourselves ready. Mentally, spiritually and physically. We do. And so, that's why I had this discussion, the scientific discussion. Because I want to show you how this thing works. Operationally and how you can change it. But you know this very last thing where it says sleep. I actually came across a study. Very interesting. The role of sleep in, cognitive, uh, in regulating... Uh, in, sorry, in cognition and emotion by Matthew Walker. Yeah, this number 28 and the, very interestingly so it, w sleep can actually affect your, your mental state especially with anxiety Allah says in this, in this very surah about sleep uh, very interesting it says that Allah he sent down a slumber upon you, which which made you, which covered you effectively. It covered all of these people. And I saw this riwayat and hadith. A lot of the fighters on in Uhud, a lot of the fighters were literally the, the, they're having micro sleep in, in there. Now, you, Subhanallah, if yani, if you understood, if you read this uh, study, which we don't have time to do, having a short nap before a fight is actually a very, very advantageous thing. Because it just calms everything down. Your whole system, your nervous system is cal calmed down. It, it gives you more sharpness, more attentiveness, more effectiveness, more cognitive ability. It soothes your sympathetic nervous system. The fact that this is mentioned in the ayah is, is, is astounding actually. It's shocking. Khabib Namagamedov, he, interestingly, he said, every time I have a fight, he said this interview, MMA fight, he goes, I have a nap before I have a fight. I go to the place and I have a nap improves his performance because it relaxes you it, it relaxes you so the, the point I'm making to you is it's so interesting that was mentioned in the area so this all the stuff we just mentioned taming emotions how to do so all the things that I mentioned in this slide I've already mentioned to you which is slide number 29 and, and this idea of one thing I haven't mentioned is talking yourself down because how, like for example, bring that back to the snake example, yeah? If you had to work in a zoo dealing with snakes, the first time you're de dealing with the snake is going to be de very panic, panic orientated. However, the second time, okay, the guy is there, he's telling you don't worry about it. This snake is, it might be venomous, but if you hold it in a certain way, he won't at attack you, whatever. He's giving you certain things. You might be, if you move quickly, he might he'll be more prone to attack you. Okay, so you, now, you, now your prefrontal cortex is working w with the snake example. If there's a lion, there's less you can do. And that's why the Quran says, even the Quran says about the Prophet, that there are certain things you'd run away from, even though we've never seen him run away from anything. What am I referring to? In Surah Al-Kahf, if you saw them in there, you'd have run. 
Allah says, if you saw these people, these people in the cave like that, you would have run. In the Quran, it says, Farrat min qaswara, for example. That it's not talking about the Prophet here, but it's talking about generally people running away from a lion. So, this is natural. There are some things which you are meant to run away from. I saw a big rat <laughs> outside of Tarawih. I jumped on a car. <laughs> Akhi, do you know, like, um, the rat was not the si It ran next to me. I said, What's this rat? It's coming to fight me. I jumped on side. Do you know, like Tom and Jerry? You know, the black woman that she was coming on the thing. And I became like that, Akhi. The rat was massive, Akhi, here in London. I jumped. You know, but there was a time where I was walking with my family and I saw a rat and I didn't flinch. I didn't move. I said, is that the rat? Yeah. And I was pretending. And in my mind, I was, I was going wild. But when I was by myself, I jumped in the car. Actually. But when you change the stakes, things can, things can happen. If you saw the, the most cowardly thing I've ever seen in my life, actually probably the most cowardly thing I've ever seen in my whole life was a video. I'm not sure if you guys have seen it. It's, it's a man with his daughter. And a dog came to bite his daughter. And the guy ran away and left his daughter to be devoured by the dog. I've never seen anything like this. It's the most cowardly thing. And the daughter was a young girl. She was screaming for her dad. He ran. <laughs> he ran away. It's an absolute... Ha I would kill myself after that. Stuff for Allah. I would, I, I would consider... If it was Jais, I would consider committing suicide. That is one of the worst... I could not live... How can you live with yourself after that? He's already dead. He's dead already, man. He's, he's a young, young baby. Daughter, like maybe three, four year old. And the dog was devouring her. And he was just... Le it wasn't just like, you know... It was a moment reaction. He left it. He left it happen. And he was just watching it. We can't, Akhi. That's... That's... Very bad. And that's why these kinds of... We need to be very careful. Because this could happen to any of us. Not that. That one I don't think will happen to any <laughs> That one. That, that one is too much, Akhi. But yeah, anything can happen where it's... And by the way, the fight or flight response can save your life one day. Yanni, uh, don't be a hero. I'm, I'm not trying to advocate being a hero. Because someone can bring out a knife and then, Yanni, run away. That's fine. You're meant to run away. There's, there's no shame. Someone brings out a knife and you don't have a knife, run away from him. There's no shame. But if you bring that out on your wife and you're her protector, then you don't run away. You let her run away. You fend him off or something. At least do a few things. Do you know what I mean? Like, give her time to run away. Yani, do you know what I mean? So every situation must be assessed. But it's putting your prefrontal cortex or back in control. And it's very interesting. As we talk about that, cowardice is one disease, but another disease is uh, doing riyat. And this guy, I came across this guy called Quzman. And this Quzman, I mean, this name, I only got it from Nawi. He's not mentioned the Hadith. The Hadith is Bukhari. And the hadith is a guy that was fighting very fiercely and ferociously. And then he was, and then the Prophet said, he's in hellfire. And the people were very disturbed by that. He said, how is he in the hellfire when he was fighting so fer ferociously? Long story short, he was a munafiq. There was this thing I found for Ibn Jawzi, which said that there was a whole story of him going back to the women in his town and they were emasculating him. Terms come. I didn't find this way anywhere. This is just Ibn Jawzi saying that. This uh, story of Qusman. As for why he, uh, and Nawi says it clearly, he just says that he's, uh, he was just one of them, Munafiq. Some people were there fighting, pretending to be a good fighter, but you are on the other side the whole time. You're a Munafiq. You're one of the, the, the defectors and hypocrites. And subhanAllah, this is such a, a beautiful story. Obey ibn Khalaf. Yeah? This bastard, sorry to say, uh, he was, <laughs> he was. He was there and he said to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you remember, the one who put the intestines on the Prophet, and he, and he said, I'm going to kill you. And he was feeding his horse and he said, I'm this horse is the one that's going to be used to kill you as well. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said, I'm going to kill you. And as soon as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw Obey, already he's declared he wants to kill him. He, Obey has declared that he wants to kill the Prophet. As soon as he saw Obey, he says, say no more. He grabbed that javelin, a spear, sorry it was, and he killed him. He killed him. And he was, by the way, for those who say the Prophet ﷺ was interested, he's a bloodthirsty person killing everyone, this is the only person he's ever killed. There's no other record of someone he's, 
he's engaged in sword fighting and stuff, but he's the only one he's ever actually killed, confirmed. And it's so, so interesting, the Prophet said, to you, I will kill you, and he killed him. That's a prediction, which shows you once again how, how uh, delicate and how sophisticated the predictions of the Prophet are. If, it was, if this was just a story, I mean, this by itself, because we saw how, and it was making our blood boil, of Abu Ibn Khalaf, what he was doing in Mecca to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If this is the only thing that could be established from the Ahud, this would be sufficient. This is a great thing that happened. Yes, there were martyrs, 70 martyrs that died from outside. And there was, there was strategic, like we went backwards strategically in one aspect. However, this by itself is a great victory. And there were 70 shuhada from the Muslims. And we know this famous story of Hamza. We know that. But by the way, the, the, the famous story of Hamza that he was killed and he was mutilated and she ate his thing. I didn't see this is not. This is not authentic. And um, I'm surprised at how many Sierra people don't mention the fact that this is not authentic. And it sh they should mention, in my opinion, that. Because that's, we're talking about the body of one of the, you know, of, of the Prophet Sassam's uncle. So why should the Ummah believe that he, his body was eaten, eaten up? No, we shouldn't believe in that. That's, that's a disrespect to the body of the, uh, of the uncle of the Prophet To even narrate something like that when it's not even authentic. But what I found interesting is the story of Wahshi. We all know the story of Wahshi. And the Prophet forgave Wahshi despite him doing that when he became Muslim. He killed his own uncle, but he forgave him. Which shows you the magnanimous nature of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there is a... Uh, I was thinking it's very interesting because Wahshi used the javelin and the way he used it, if you look at the story of how he killed Hamza, he used it when he actually did it when he was looking away. He didn't do it face to face. He knew. And subhanAllah, Hamza turned around and he wanted to fight him. <laughs> Even though the, the javelin is inside him, <laughs> fight him, Akhi. It shows you the level of bravery that this man had. He wants to fight someone, the javelin is inside, but he still fight. Akhi, unbelievable, man. <laughs> unbelievable. Shocking. But then obviously he bled to death. But the, the point is, is that I was, I was looking at, because I was thinking, it, we usually associate East Africans with long distance running, as stereotypical as it may sound. But I came across this particular guy who's referred to as Mr. YouTube. Very, I don't know if you come across this story. Have you come across this story? He's a, he's a Kenyan gold medalist in the Beijing Games. And he's a javelin. The guy's built like a tank. And he's, he threw it and Achi, do you know how? Because they don't have the facilities for it in Kenya. So he learned how to throw the javelin on YouTube. He went on YouTube. He saw, if you watch his video, it's, it's actually fascinating. Because I was thinking to, 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 to kill Hamza, he must have had that strength. But then the Kenyans are not known for the javelin. Then I was shocked to find the Kenyans were actually known for it. Imagine if they had facilities, like in European facilities, how many... Gold medalist we get. This guy, Mr. YouTube, going to YouTube. <laughs> if you see the video, he was, he was learning how to throw the javelin literally on YouTube, Akhi. And he became the most formidable javelin thrower in the world. I don't know what his actual name is, Mr. YouTube. <laughs> so many of the people died at that time. Hamza died, very famous story. Musa bin Nu'amir, honorable death. We can't go into details about that. Handala, very interesting. You know, he had the new wife, and the way he puts it here in the, in the, in the sealed nectar, he said, "From his wife's lap to a, from his wife's lap to a sword fight." Hmm. Yeah, and he was just having intercourse with his wife, new wife, good times, huh? And then he has to fight straight away. <laughs> but you know, it shows you that he wasn't going to say no to her. Is the time for the Sahabi? Is this the same Sheikh Handala Sa'a or Sa'a Handala? It must be. Because yeah. this Handala, a very famous hadith, he, he said, Look, when I'm with my family and stuff, I'm always having a good time. I feel a bit of a hypocrite because I come here and I'm very serious in the masjid. But when I'm with my family, I'm very. You know what I mean? So the Prophet said to him, Sa'a or Sa'a Handala. Spend one hour doing this having fun and good time, and one hour being serious. It's a philosophy of life. And one that he lived and died by, actually. <laughs> SubhanAllah. No, it's true. And he was Shaheed. 
and he was called the Ghasil, the one who was washed by because he was washed by the angels. Because you know, after for those who don't know, Muslim non-Muslims are watching this. I'm sure. Uh, when we have intercourse in, in religion of Islam, you have to have a whole bath, have shower and stuff like that. It's like, <laughs> obviously, if you ejaculate by other means, you have to do the same thing. Uh, but, but the point is, is that so because he didn't have the time to go and to the shower, so the angels done it on his behalf in a metaphysical manner. Muhammad, did did um. In our culture, we still say if somebody's like a savage or a barbarian, we call him Weshi. Oh, really? Yeah, they say Weshi, I say. It's, it's, is it the same in Arabic as well? The way you call Wahshiya, right? It's, it's a pejorative term. Yeah. So if somebody's really savage or Wahshi, yeah. we say he's a Weshi. Mutawahish, yeah. Well, because what would you say? That? It's, not from, it's not from this Wahshi, is it? It's not from the same. It's, it's just from the, from the idea of. A beast. No, it, it would have been from this person. No, I mean, but the, the word in Arabic itself means beast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what the connotation that we yeah. use it in. Yeah. But this was pre-him. Oh, okay. Like, for example, وَإِذَا الْحُشِرَةِ uh, For example, in the Quran, it says, when the beasts come together. Mm. So, this individual, was his actual given name Washi, or is it, you know... <laughs> it's interesting. Was that his given name? Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a, a good slave, question. So who knows? Yeah, yeah, he was a slave. And he was, I mean, he's, he was doing this to free himself, to be honest, Yanni. He wanted, to free, he wanted freedom. So he killed Hamza. Yeah, he didn't engage in the battle. The only thing he did just... He just stood in the bush. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Wait, it's for, he's a, <laughs> the, And that's wrong. Yanni, if, you if you're not interested in... Your freedom shouldn't be prioritized of someone's life. If, you're not, if, you, if you don't believe in the cause of these people, your freedom is not impo more important than someone's life. If, if you had a slave, sorry to say, because some people say, well, I understand where Wash is coming from. <laughs> so he was a slave. He was doing an act of resistance. <laughs> no, it's not an act of resistance. Because, and and what, what they call it there, the uh, Finkelstein was mentioning this as well. The, what's that, what's that uh, famous, famous uh, revolt? Um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, when the, when the slaves were revolted. Yeah, the, yeah. That, that revolt. Yeah. And he said, we're going to kill every white man. Yeah. That's wrong. That kind of thing is wrong. You're, you're free, you're, you're, the fact that you're in prison under these conditions is a wrong. But it doesn't mean you've got to kill somebody now. So you can get out of those conditions. That means you're no worse than your slave master, frankly. Because your slave master put you in this position. Yeah? And you're killing someone to get out of that position. This person's got nothing to do with it. Do you know what I mean? So it shouldn't be like this. The, what's, I know, the, what's the revolt called? I forgot, the, I forgot the guy's name. Nat Turner. Oh, yeah, Nat, Turner. Nat Turner. Nat Turner. Nat Turner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just, oh, it's, it's like the Nat Turner. The, the, I don't like that. Frankly, I don't even like that um, example because I don't agree with that. So, and it will kill all the whites. Well, yeah, and who, who, what gives you the right and the license to, to kill all the whites? No, no one has uh, uh, that. Sorry to say. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> to be honest with you. Okay. Now, there are some things we can mention about Bir al-Ma'un and Raji'ah, but we'll mention that in the next uh, session because we don't want to uh, spend too much time. What I do want to say is I'll, I'll, I'll mention what Ross Rogers, uh, quite an interesting thing. We, we briefly mentioned him in Badr, but I'll mention him again here. Uh, in fact, uh, does someone want to read it? For, let me read it. It's fine. Not a problem. So, this is him commenting on Uhud. He says... Many years after Muhammad's era, وسلم, following the massive campaigns of, uh, to defeat Napoleon in the early 1800s, a German staff owner named Karl von Clausewitz penned the draft of his now famous On War. If one were to ask reasonably educated military theorists or Western military officer about what they remember about Clausewitz, they would typically quote his famous dictum, that war is simply a continuation of political intercourse with the addition of other means. However, if one were to sum up Clausewitz's thinking in a single sentence, it would be found in his opening chapter, war is thus an act to force, to compel our enemy to do our will. The statement is so simple as to be earth-shattering, yet is a concept largely neglected by many observers throughout history. This principle is echoed either explicitly or implicitly, 
by the great writers on war. Sun Tzu, writing around 500 BC, tells us that victory is the main ob object in war. If this is long delayed, weapons are blunted and morale depressed. It is also implied by the likes of Antoine Henry de Jomini, uh, and was explicitly articulated by Mao Zedong. The key theorists of war understood that most the most fundamental aspects of war was to force an enemy to do one's will. In contrast, so now he's connecting this to Abu Sufyan and Muhammad Sasa. Abu Sufyan saw war as a game, a contest in which sides trade. Uh, each side trades triumphs back and forth in the ebb and tides of martial sport. In essence, he saw no end with Muhammad. In contrast, the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet's view of war was dramatically different. On countless occasions, he indicated that the final, ultimate triumph would belong to Islam. For Abu Sufyan, there was no such thing as victory. For Muhammad, there was no substitute for victory. Very interesting. And there is, he was commenting on you know, if you, the end of Ahud, or how people see the end of it is where Abu Sufyan is calling out, is Muhammad there, is Abu Bakr there, is Umar there? And then the Prophet ﷺ says, don't say anything. He says, be quiet, leave them, leave them to it. And then he started to attack Allah's rights and then the Prophet ﷺ says, respond to him. Which there's lessons in that in itself. But then Abu Sufyan famously said, one for one. So you've, you've beaten us one time, we've beat you one time now. Now this one for one thing is what he's commenting on because it shows you the mentality of Abu Sufyan. The mentality of Abu Sufyan is that this is just a game we're playing some kind of we're, we're, we're playing for it's like a sports. You want today, you maybe I want tomorrow, you mean after tomorrow. Whereas Muhammad Sallallahu was not like that. Muhammad Sallallahu was all about we're gonna win. And it's gonna be an ultimate victory. So this idea of an ultimate victory and it does go back to this idea of a, the, the, the infinite player versus the finite player in game theory as well. It's connected. Because the infinite player thinks that I'm continuing until I reach whatever. The finite player just wants in and out. Which is one, one of the reasons why Israel will never win. Actually. Because it, it, Israel is a finite player in game theory. So all they want to do is they want to they don't, they want to finish their mission and, and, and live their lives. That's what they want. Live the European life. Whereas the infinite player, who is in this case, let's say Hamas, or whoever, whatever resistance group decides to emerge other than Hamas, whatever group, I should say, decides to emerge other than Hamas, any violent group, is that we are not, this is life and death for us. And it will always, in game theory, the infinite player always wins. Because they have, their whole life is that. Whereas the finite player wants to finish early. And with that, we will conclude. And hopefully, you have benefited this session. We'll see you next session. We'll talk about some of the things that happened before Uhud and Ahzab. And we will jump straight into Al-Ahzab. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.